Hi David, thanks for taking the time to talk to us again. Last time out we were focused on mobile malware, but this time we're turning our attention to social networks and the associated risks that they can introduce. So what do you think of the rise in social networking, and how does our increased use of them relate to a company like Kaspersky Lab? Hi Steve, and thanks for the opportunity to come back and talk through the security implications of another important area of our lives today. The emergence of social networking is having a dramatic effect on our lives. First, we need to put it in context. Social networking sites emerged as part of what is sometimes called Web 2.0. In other words, the development of an interactive World Wide Web that allows anyone to contribute to what's online rather than simply just being a passive recipient like it used to be in the past. It's the difference between shopping at the supermarket and cultivating your own produce. Now, this has led to an explosion in the volume of data posted online from every aspect of people's lives. Consider this. In any one minute, 50,000 links are shared, 66,000 photos are tagged, 74,000 friends are invited to events, 79,000 wall posts are written, 98,000 friend requests are approved, and so on and so on. You could go on for ages with these. But it's big, big numbers. It's a big part of our lives. Yes, that's certainly a vast amount of activity and information. So why are cyber criminals interested in social networks? Is this a new route for known threats like malware and identity theft? Or is it bringing something new into the picture as well? Like pickpockets in the real world, cyber criminals follow the crowds. And the online crowds today are to be found in social networks. First, they use them as a way of spreading their malicious code. They can do it by creating fake profiles or by using stolen login details to take over legitimate accounts. Imagine that my Facebook account, for example, has been hacked. The cyber criminals could use it to send out a message containing a link to a Trojan. Since the message is from me, my friends would be much more likely to click on the link. From the cyber criminal's perspective, it's a lot less speculative than just using spam email to distribute links to malware as far and wide as they can. Second, they use them to commit identity theft. For example, by harvesting personal information, they're able to gain access to online bank accounts. It may not be apparent at first sight how they do it. After all, few of us would actually share our bank account information on Facebook or Twitter. At least I hope we wouldn't. But the current threat landscape is characterized by the word steal everything. Cyber criminals actually gather data of all kinds and then mine it for specific nuggets of gold. And they're prepared to aggregate the data that they steal from different places. So that obviously sounds worrying. And from what you said earlier, there's certainly a large amount of data to be had. But how might they actually go about getting it? Well, here's how it might play out. It's difficult to remember a complicated password, so you make do with a simple, easy-to-remember password, or you use the same password for each online account, or you just recycle them for different accounts, for example, David1, David2, David3, etc. Many social networking and other sites use your email address as a login or username. You're very active on Facebook, Twitter and other sites posting lots of personal information. This includes the names of your wife, children, dog, cat, etc. But maybe also your date of birth, your place of birth, your address, maybe where you bank, where you shop. Cyber criminals just need to trick you into disclosing the password to one of your social networking sites. Maybe you get a phishing message claiming to come from the admin for that site, asking you to reconfirm details, or they tell you that your account has been hacked and you need to click on a link to enter your details to reclaim it. And bingo! They then speculative try the same password for other accounts, maybe your online bank account. So, like I said earlier, they cast their net far and wide, but the data they grab in that net they use very carefully, selectively. Is it just these core personal details like dates of birth, addresses, etc. that the cyber criminals want? Or are we also vulnerable through the thoughts and opinions that we share online as well? Well, they'll make use of anything they can find. So we actually need to be cautious about everything we share online. Some things we post in social networks could impact us in ways that may not be obvious at first. I read recently about somebody who posted a morning after the night before photograph to his Facebook wall, along with a comment to his friends that he was going to pull a sickie. Soon after, of course, he lost his job, not surprisingly. When you look at it retrospectively, obviously it wasn't obvious to him. Not long ago, 
a, a guy called Lee Van Bryan made a tweet just before a trip to the US and he said, free this week for a quick gossip or prep before I go and destroy America. Now, by destroy, he meant party. But that's not how the US authorities read it, and he was actually denied entry to the US. We need to assume that anything we share online might enter the public domain. And if we wouldn't be happy seeing something splashed across the front page of a national newspaper, then we really shouldn't post it. Yes, I've heard and read about similar stories, and I think it's really a case of realising that we're creating a publicly and potentially permanently visible record of ourselves, rather than posting into a closed forum that we can expect to be able to control. Thinking about it from another perspective, there can clearly be a threat to companies as well as to individuals. Do you think there's enough recognition of this amongst organisations, and what ought they to be doing about it, for example in terms of policy and awareness raising for their employees? Cyber criminals harvest data indiscriminately, but they make use of it selectively. Over the last 18 months, we've seen a steady increase in the number of targeted attacks on organisations of all kinds. These attacks may make use of very sophisticated techniques, but they often begin by exploiting humans. What you post in a social network could be used to set up an attack on your employer. Let's say, for example, that your company has just upgraded to the latest version of Application X and you really don't like it as much as the old version. So you say so on Twitter or in another social network. Now this sounds pretty innocuous, and actually it is. But without realising it, you may just have provided an attacker with the means necessary to get a foothold in your company. Instead of guessing which of the many possible vulnerabilities might compromise your security, uh, in the company, they now know that a vulnerability for the latest version of Application X will work for them. Even knowing who you work for could be used in an attack. They could, for example, create a phishing email directed to you and spoofed to look like it's come from your IT department, asking you to click on a link and enter your network login and password. Yes, and we've seen direct evidence that ploys such as these can work. In fact, we described something similar in one of the podcasts about social engineering elsewhere in our collection. So what evidence have you and your colleagues seen of the threats in practice? What's the likelihood of someone coming into contact with these problems? There's no shortage of things cyber criminals are using social networks for. To date, we've seen messages with links to malicious code. We've seen phishing messages. We've seen the coordination of botnets through Twitter. We've seen clickjacking, in other words, hijacking legitimate clicks by hiding malicious HTML code or script underneath them or above them. We've seen malvertising, in other words, online advertising used to spread, spread malware. We've seen fake friend requests, and we've seen fake apps which are used to steal personal data. Most of these are geared in one way or another towards harvesting personal data. Now, to put this in perspective, I'd like to give an indication of the statistical weight of social networks in the overall malware mix, so to speak. We recently published our 2011 security bulletin. That's a roundup of the trends we saw last year and the prospects for this year. The report included a chart showing the breakdown of where we've seen malicious links being planted. 21% of these links were being placed in social networks, behind entertainment sites and search engines, but ahead of advertising sites and adult sites. So it's a big percentage of, of the, uh, the overall mix. And in Q3 2011, Facebook was the biggest web resource in which visitors were redirected to malicious sites. The continued growth in social networks means that we're likely to see more and more activities of this kind in the future. Yes, it's another example of the attackers going where the users are to be found. With this in mind, are all the platforms equally affected, or are you more likely to face risks in some more than others? For example, would a user on Facebook be likely to face more, less, or similar risks to someone on LinkedIn? Well, as I mentioned, cyber criminals follow the crowds. In other words, they focus their activities on those sites that attract the biggest number of people. So, it'll come as no surprise to any of us that Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn have all been targeted by cyber criminals. But the list does include other social networks that are popular in specific regions around the world, such as, for example, uh, the Contactia in Russia or Orkut in Brazil and other places, actually. Do you think the users have enough awareness of what they're doing by posting things online? 
What I'm thinking of here are things like the longevity and permanency of the data. The fact that even if they've initially shared it only with their friends, there's nothing to stop somebody else taking the content and sharing it more widely. And also the various other ways in which they might be adversely affected. Many people are completely unaware of the potential dangers. Most of us would think twice about inviting a stranger into our house, or wandering down a dark alley alone at night, or crossing the road without first checking to see if it's safe to do so. But sadly, there's no equivalent online common sense, so to speak, that gets passed down from one generation to another. I think part of the reason for this is that the internet is still new, in relative terms at least, and for the most part, the people who've grown up with it aren't yet parents. Another reason is that we all feel cushioned when we access the internet. We do it from the safety of our homes or our offices or using a personal mobile device. We don't physically see those who may do us harm and typically there's no causal connection between an action we take online, for example posting a photograph, telling the world that we're going to go on holiday, giving out some personal information and the consequences of that action which may be having money taken from our bank account. On top of this, people sometimes compromise their own security because security may be inconvenient. Take passwords, for example. I should mix letters, numbers and symbols. I should use a unique password for each online account. And I shouldn't recycle them. But that's inconvenient. Of course, having money stolen from my bank account is a lot more inconvenient. But the danger of that up front is potential, whereas the inconvenience is immediate. Finally, it's worth recognising that people sometimes compromise their security simply because they, they're faced with the lure of something for nothing, and everybody likes something for nothing. Of course, from another perspective, there's a question of whether users actually care. Mark Zuckerberg was quoted a while back suggesting that privacy is no longer a social norm, and that Generation Y users seem to have less concern about it. How does this increase the challenge of helping to protect them? Do you think Mark Zuckerberg is right? And do you think that the services make it easy enough for users to understand and configure their privacy and information sharing? In fact, I guess that from the service provider's perspective, things work best if users provide more information and share it as widely as possible. I don't think that what Zuckerberg suggested is necessarily true, although you could be forgiven for thinking that respect for people's privacy is no longer a social norm. In some cases, the most private thing on a site is the privacy policy, telling you what the site is entitled to do with the data you post. If you combine this with the default settings you find on some social networks, it's very difficult often to safeguard your privacy, even if you do realise that there's a price to pay for not doing so. So I'd come back to my earlier points, actually. What's most important is the fact that people are unaware of the dangers. Yes, although some of them are getting better, I think that the privacy policies hardly provide much clarity in some cases. And even then, they're focusing mostly on what the sites themselves will do with your information, and they don't cover the risks that I mentioned earlier about what other users, including your friends, may do with it. So what tips would you offer to listeners that now want to safeguard their online identity? To what extent is there a technology solution, as we see with things like antivirus, and how much does it come down to user awareness and personal responsibility? Well, technology certainly has a part to play. The best internet security solutions today can not only block malicious code proactively, they can also alert you to vulnerabilities that exist in applications on your system, they can secure your online transactions, they can block spam, they can secure your children's online activities, not only blocking undesirable content, but preventing children from posting sensitive data, and much more of course as well. They can also encrypt your data, and they can create complex passwords for you as well, storing them securely and entering them automatically when you need to log into some online account. Now, on top of that, it's really also important that we all adopt a security mindset. I'm not talking here about making everyone a security expert. That would be unrealistic. But we do all need to think security. And I'd identify six general areas that we all need to think about. The first is this, think about what you're accessing. Always use HTTPS to access a website when you're going to be entering personal data because this secures the communication between you and the bank, the online store, etc. The second is, think about how you're accessing something. Use unique complex passwords for each resource and if necessary use a password manager application to do it. 
The third thing is think where you're accessing a resource from. Is it a secure business network? If it's a public network, are you using a VPN to secure access to business resources? Is it a home network? If so, is it secure? Is it your computer or a public computer? Are you at the airport, in an internet cafe, etc.? Fourth, think about the privacy implications of the social network you're joining. Be very careful about reading the privacy policy and look at the default privacy options, specifically what the provider may use your personal details for and actually who owns the data. The fifth thing is limit what can be seen and shared by others. Don't accept friend requests from people you don't actually know and never respond to messages asking for confidential data. It's worth remembering you've got a telephone if you want to double check something. The sixth thing, above all, don't post anything that you wouldn't want to see on the front page of a national newspaper. Yes, I guess that while some people wouldn't mind such coverage if it was positive, things don't always work out that way. David, thanks very much again for taking the time to speak to us. That's my pleasure, Steve. You're welcome.